Welcome to the Gregarious Mammal Podcast. This is Chris. And this is Kate. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's been a little while since our last Lynx show. Uh, there's been a couple of interviews. We've both been kind of busy. Yeah. It's no excuse, I know. Well, it's the usual excuse. I think the word busy needs to be replaced. With what? It doesn't really mean, <laughs> I know, it doesn't really mean anything anymore. We've been working. Everyone says they're busy. I don't know. <laughs> I like to say... Occupied. <laughs> that sounds like a bathroom. Sure the better. bathroom is occupied on the plane, you know? Yeah. Doesn't quite they've, work. They've been full. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work either. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe listeners, you could give us a new word for busy. Because yeah. I think the power of the word busy has long since expired. Yeah. Unfortunately. Like having a degree. Oh, yeah. Anyway, let's, let's move on. We've got a bit to speak about uh, as we've got a lot to catch up with. We do. We have a, a few sort of chunks of topics. So our first little section on the show is on AI, artificial intelligence. We have a little chunk of topics on this theme. And I do believe the first one is yours, Kate. Something to do with AI and the law. Absolutely. Um, this article is by Stefan Costarellis from Techly, uh, an Australian publication, and it deals with AI um, being used by uh, basically, I guess, a little competition between lawyers and AI um, by law geeks. Um, it was like a research study where they got 20 lawyers that were very experienced against the AI program that was designed to solve legal problems and um, basically to see who could spot errors in contracts with the most speed and accuracy. And if you're thinking, God, that sounds appallingly bad, um, well, this is what lawyers were doing. Like, you know, do you remember Clueless? Anyone seen that, that movie Clueless from the um, 90s mm, mm. where they mm -hmm. um, have to sit down with a highlighter and go and find someone's name or something like that through this whole document? Mm. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. And basically what happened was that human lawyers found 85% of the errors. AI found 80... Sorry, AI found 94%. So whilst the, um, the speed was comparative... Um, actually, no, it wasn't. It's, it's okay. What, what it says here is while the best human lawyer did manage to equal AI in terms of speed, overall, it was an absolute washout, which is, which is a little, a little confusing because the next sentence says it took the human an average of 92 minutes to get through the task. The AI took 26 seconds. And the lawyers drank 12 coffees, which 12 I, coffees, I like. 12 coffees, yeah. Which, out. <laughs> you know. And look, um, I think this is a really interesting area because we're talking about this idea that we're going to be using uh, AI and using well, what have you. It could be chatbots, could be um, uh, greeting robots, it could be any type of um, data automation or um, analysis um, all these kind of tech tools as ways to, to make jobs easier, to change roles, and also to, um, in effect, change the skill set and, and also careers. You know, mm. if your job was a, a fact checker, and I know that is a job in, in some law, law firms like the first year students and stuff, that's going to radically change if you've got these type of programs. I mean, you know, even just I remember for uh, my mum worked in a law firm for many years, so even just having anything digitalized was a big introduction you know these are, are radically changing some of these career sets mm. and um you know I, I think sometimes we get focused on uh you know ah, oh, you know the lawyer, the robots are going to take our jobs but they're what they are i mean they're going to change our jobs they're not going to take them they're i think change th them. there's there's an interesting thing here i mean firstly actually 85 to 94 percent is not well, too no. bad um but obviously this is probably early days i mean Actually, this is a very particular subset of law. Correct. And they basically said that AIs will replace humans in anything that is repetitive and involves lots of data. Correct. So this is about who could spot errors in a contract, which is something that humans are probably very bad at because we just switch off very quickly, whereas a computer is very good at this. Mm. This is not an AI fighting a legal case and no. trying to win over a jury. I think that will involve lawyers... Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, for a while yet. I mean, this is a very specific area. And this is something that I think this is, again, as we've discussed so many times, where AI is going to be useful is supplementing the human. Yeah. So the AI helps the human go through and process all this data and the lawyer 
the human focuses on the the emotional stuff, the the stuff that it would be very hard for a machine to to process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually wrote an article on this, um, which was published this week, on uh, how do we prepare for an era of human machine partnerships. Mm. Because that's how I do see it. I do see it as humans and machines being partners to complete jobs and tasks. I mean, digitization um, is already here. You know, everything from the self-service checkout to, um, you know, um, uh, robots being used on the land to sow seeds or to check the um, sensors to check the water, the water um, quality or depth or what have you. This stuff Mm. is already here. And I, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, touch on a couple of points from that that I think are really interesting. I mean, one of the companies I've been following for quite a while, which I hadn't heard of until I moved here um, from Australia, is called Ocado. And they're actually one of the biggest companies, and basically in the UK, and what they do is... um, Deliveries, online deliveries, like, um, you know, uh, the, the supermarkets do it here in Germany or in, in the UK or, sorry, the US. Um, but they firstly, they have this really elaborate robotic system of to setting up their, um, their warehouses. And they've been involved um, in this program called Second Hands for a couple of years, which I've, I've, I've been um, talking to them about before and basically it's a bunch of international researchers um they got some funding from eu horizon 2020 which is an interesting point about some of that funding what happens after brexit um for the uk people who do get most of it (laughs) and basically they've been working on this project um of uh developing robot assistants that are trained to understand maintenance tasks so they can proactively um or be or with some prompting um respond um, to a you know a routine request or or um, be involved in in preventive maintenance, and um, they've released their prototype recently um, in January, so it's quite cool. Mm. But some of the other points I think you alluded to as well. I mean, firstly, this idea that we're going to really come about with these soft skills, the idea of cultivating and valuing soft skills in workplaces, things that people um, can do that a robot or a bot or a, an AI program or whatever you want to call it will never be able to do the same way as us. They will be mm. able to do some of it. We could we could look at things like creativity, emotional intelligence, interpersonal skills. So actually, Kate, this leads very nicely into our next article, which mm. apparently I suggested. Or I don't remember reading this, so we'll see how we go here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, this is on the New York Times: How to Make AI That's Good for People. Ah. Um, it actually, firstly, interestingly, opens in the second paragraph with: When I was a graduate student in computer science in the early two thousands, computers were barely able to detect sharp edges in photographs. Um, I was also a computer science graduate in the early 2000s, and we wrote many programs that were able to take sharp edges in photographs, so I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what, what, um, what uh, school not sure about that university, university this writer went to, but anyway, <laughs> and we were doing them uh, quite easily. But anyway, um, and Photoshop has existed for a long time, so I'm not entirely sure about that line, hmm. but anyway. Um, and this is a fairly uh, sort of broad article around uh, yeah the impact on society uh the human centeredness or the the what should be the human centeredness of mm-hmm. ai um uh reflecting actually this ties very nicely to an interview that was on uh the feed last week i think mm-hmm. um from uh, emo shape about having ais that actually have some breadth of emotion in mm-hmm. them to uh, to make us more comfortable with them um and what's the other there's also yeah more human sensitivities i guess it's it's just it's just the the uh, the broad concept of putting a bit more thought into the ais um ais are made by humans at the moment yeah that's it <laughs> uh and then again about the the work ideal um that AI should complement and supplement humans, not replace. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, there's nothing particularly new in this post that we, we haven't discussed before, we haven't heard before, but uh, as a kind of follow-up to what we're talking about here, it might be worth just diving into. Mm, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a nice little overview of some of the issues and looking at, across a few different sectors. And the, um, the author, Fei-Fei Lee, is actually a professor of computer science at Stanford. 
um, mm. where she directs the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, and mm-hmm. she's also the chief scientist of AI research at Google Cloud. And uh, sort of rounding up the uh, serious articles on AI, this is actually not a new post at all, uh, and I've been meaning to include it in the show for a little while, but I just, I don't know, I just forgot, and now it seemed to fit quite nicely into this segment. It's actually from nearly a year ago on the uh, Wait But Why blog uh, about Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk's sort of one of his many side projects. Mm. I'm never entirely sure which ones are his side projects and which one are his main projects, um, about their sort of uh, brain control venture. Yeah. And this post is incredibly long mm. with a lot of illustrations and a lot of science going through from the basic to the advanced on how something like Neuralink might actually work. Um, and I will recommend yet again a book that I always love when it comes to this topic, the book uh, Make It So, which is about sort of science fiction interfaces and brain control is certainly one of those. But this is a, a, a very accessible and fascinating post on, um, yeah, on, on how to how th- how that actually could work in theory. I, I don't think you've read it, Kate. To be honest with you, I read it a while ago anyway. But I haven't <laughs> read it. Um, I, I do know a bit about Neuralink. I've written about them before. Mm. But I've got to say, like, I, know, I, I know radio is not a visual medium, but I would but really encourage you to post, check yeah. this out for the images. It's got the most it's fabulous images. Post. Yeah, and I've been wanting to put more images back into my stuff, but images take a bit of time. Oh, yeah, they've done a lot uh, of work here. This is like a yeah. major kind of undertaking it's got so many images it's fantastic yeah. no, it, <laughs> so it's very yeah. long yeah it's, a, it's not a short piece no uh, but it has got a lot of images so <laughs> <laughs> it's one for a, a rainy day maybe with a big cup of coffee to sit down and, and deep dive into Neuralink um yeah. and then you know the brain machine interface and all that kind of stuff and I think um I'll be very interested to see what actually happens. I mean, I've probably been following Kernel a lot closer because they seem to have a a, a little mm. bit more um, uh, exposure, perhaps, in actually talking about what they're doing. Um, and they're basically working particularly on um, Alzheimer's and those kind of conditions. So they're, there's slightly a medical focus. Um, yeah. Which is really interesting. I'll, I'll, I've got a link somewhere. Um, I have written about it, so I'll, I'll pop it in the show notes so people can have a quick look. I think I last time I sort of played with this kind of stuff was um, when CES was on and Nissan released the um, uh, <laughs> the prototype headset, which was basically a, a brain computer interface for driving. And the idea was that the um, the, the self driving car could anticipate the person um, before they. They acted or something like that. I can't quite remember mm. exactly, but um, mm. yeah, it's worth. It's definitely worth checking some of this stuff out. It's very interesting if you like this kind of neurology and things like that, which I do. All right, I mean, Neuralink isn't actually completely AI. I sort of sandwiched that one in there, but uh, <laughs> oh, maybe got a maybe, good maybe of it. that was a bit of a, an inappropriate uh, filling in a, an AI sandwich. But Segway's now to, always add, good. to to add the um, well, to add the tangy tomato sauce to the top of the sandwich, uh, here's a, a slightly lighter <laughs> article to end our AI segment on, and this is called I, I don't actually know what the first few words mean, but anyway, oh hi spectral slug AI makes new D and D monsters. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think. I think this is one of those areas where if I wanted to get fussy, I could say this isn't really an AI, but uh, (laughs) it's just a computer generative algorithm. But um, anyway, research scientist Janelle Shane trained a neural network to create D&D monsters. Behold, Hat Fright, Giant Freth Warp, Wendless Wall, and, oh God, Maragana... Oh, hello. Hang on. Let's try this again. (laughs) Maragana (laughs) Wraith. Imagine saying that after a few beers. Being a keen D and D player, where there are char- there are monsters that are basically giant rabbits and have uh, equally bizarre names generated by humans, uh, this is not particularly uh, it's not particularly not particularly uh, surprising, really. I mean, this is actually I think this is doing a fairly good job. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a, a training data set of two thousand creatures from the second edition Dungeons and Dragons. That's actually quite old. And when things were a little crazier, so, so um, I don't think it actually 
I don't know if it gave them any statistics or anything like that. That's the thing I'd be interested in. Like, if it did it generate names or did it actually generate creatures you could use in a, in a game? I'm not sure, but that's a bit of, bit of fun. <laughs> Do you have anything to say on this game? <laughs> <laughs> um, as, a, as a non-player, my, my question would be, has she played using some of these characters? Well, this is what I'm saying. I don't, as far as I can tell, it's just generating... Oh. Names? Like, like does it know. give you the character? I'm, I'm because assu- I've seen you have these sheets of paper. Yeah. Like, does it give you the tell you about the character, the characteristics? I think that's the term I'm thinking. That's 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 what I mean. I, I'm. Was it just it like should. a name generator? I'm not sure because a name generator certainly isn't an AI. I would. Yeah. The article isn't very clear. I yeah. might have to dig in further because that would then be more useful. Because uh, there are certain rules to creating a and D monster that's oh. fair. Um, so maybe sure. you need to contact her on Twitter or something and see if she wants to explain it on the show next time. Not a or bad something. idea. Not a bad idea. And just yeah. remember, if you are facing a purple lard dragon, then you better get out your gland growth and shield of farts. Um, yes. Anyway, I'm not sure what to say to that. That sounds really, really quite odd. But okay. All right. <laughs> Continuing the theme of games. This is one from me again. Yeah. Kate. I know you have certainly watched me play it, but have you ever played in any version Civilization, Sid Meier's Civilization? No. No? I don't think so. Maybe. Well, it's pretty much um, my favourite game. I think any version. I think probably these days Civ 2 to 4 probably. Civ 1 probably feels a bit rudimentary now uh, to play. Sid Meier's also created a lot of other games, but Civilization, I guess, is his sort of magnum opus. And there's an article here on a website called the Digital Antiquarian, um, where it's basically the the, the origin story of civilization. Mm. Um, and I love the fact that him and the co-creator of the game, um, Bruce Shelley, mm-hmm. they basically made this game that, in my mind, and probably especially when it was created in the '90s, was is an absolute epic. And they created this game largely in their spare time, which <laughs> which I find even more amazing. That's very um, admirable. Yeah, it's, it's it's just quite a nice little fascinating story of mm. just how uh, a crazy idea became successful um, and has gone on to, yeah, I mean, this this game has had many, many editions. It's still, they're still making new versions of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very popular and it's basically a... Turn, but it's basically like a huge board game on um, on a computer screen. And yeah. actually, this is interesting as well because uh, there's a little bit of um, controversy around this. Um, there, so just to confuse matters, there is a board game based on the computer game, but prior to that, there was actually a board game before the computer game came out with the same name and very similar concepts, um, and. This has always been somewhat legally controversial. Uh, and obviously the computer game was far more successful than the board game. And uh, the Sid Meier claims that he had never heard of the board game. And others say he must have, etc. Anyway, that's, that's something, an argument lost in the depths of time. But um, yeah, it's always interesting to read about this stuff, especially in those early days when things were much more kind of... When I say like pirates, seat of your pants and pirates, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it was a new industry and people just kind of did things without mm. worrying about stuff too much. <laughs> oh, well, you know. Anyway, I don't know if you, you probably don't have very much to, to say on this one, Kate, but actually it combines AI. Civilization, civilization definitely has an AI. Yeah. Um, yeah, and these will be a very early AI. Just to remind people, AI is nothing new. That's uh, right. It's been about what's existed at least since the 70s. Yeah. Um, yeah, at least. Time. So. All right, Kate, from building civilizations to um, to the world of work and work equality. Yeah. This article from UK. Yeah, this one's from James Watkins for Aussie.com. O-Z-Y, that is, not Aussie is in Australia. Um, and the article's titled, Where Women Work More Than Men. Uh, it's actually, can you think where it might be, Chris? Well, um, no, because I've got the article in front of me, so I know where it is. But <laughs> well, I would yeah. have probably hazarded a guess that it would be somewhere of communist or ex-communist leanings. <laughs> You'd be right. <laughs> Correct. It's actually Belarus. Um, where the... 
GDP per capita is about $18,616, which is a little bit scary. Um, basically, the labor force participation rate, which is basically those that are working, looking for work in the working age population, is 86% for women and 79% for men. So that's based on a study that was done. Um, and and what it, I guess what it breaks down to is for every 100 men working, there's 108 women working. Um, and this is different to literally every other country where men are more economically active than, than women. Um, mm. And it's, it's interesting because Belarus has um, one of the most female-heavy populations in the world. I mean... Most in most countries, mo- okay, I'm going to rephrase that. In most Western countries, so if we think of like UK, Australia, America, Canada, etc., um, the gender ratio per capita is pretty, 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 pretty similar, you know. But there, it's actually um, 54% women to men. You might think it's just that the um, there's more women than men in Belarus, which is is true. It's actually that women are actually working longer than men, mm. so. Um, Women have traditionally always worked um, because that is the ethos of the socialist uh, economy, if you like, since the 30s, where um, the idea of the, you know, people received um, family leave, fully paid, um, and also unpaid leave uh, to have when they had children, which meant that their jobs had to be saved. And there's also government-sponsored childcare. So the incentives to work are a lot higher. The, the the you know the incentives to to economically participate in your country, um, however there is also another actual um, factor which isn't you know as as positive sounding unfortunately, um, to, which is just the issue that the um, proportion of working women has changed due to the decimation of the male population due to well genocide and. Um, and lo- local wars and that kind of stuff. I, I was also wondering on a lighter side of that, mm. is it also that they suffer from, I think, a similar problem to um, Romania and Bulgaria at the moment in that a lot of uh, people are leaving. And I would hazard a guess, because this is often what we see in the West, that a lot of the people who do leave for economic reasons are men. So yeah, there's less point. men left in the country for a variety uh, of reasons. I think you're right. And, mm. and, and, you know, the unemployment rate there is incredibly low. It's like 0.5%. Really? Um, wow. Officially, but unofficially, it's considered to be a lot higher, um, mm. you know, this stuff. I mean, let's, and let's be honest here, the cost of living here is, you know, is the, and the earning capacity is, is limited, you know. It's, it's a poor country. It's not, mm. you're not going to be earning a large amount of money. Um, but it is, it's important to note as well that um, as a country, even though women take home most women, like more women have degrees. I think it's 27% more women than men have bachelor degrees. Um, mm. More women are employed in white collar professions. However, women are still earning less. So they're still mm. earning like three quarters of the pay packet. And that, that, I, it's an important distinction there that I'm going to make. Some people get really confused about this one. I'm not suggesting that they earn more because they have children. It's actually just based on a weekly pay. It's not based on, you know, their earning capacity over a, a lifetime or what have you. Um so yeah, it's look. This stuff is really interesting, and it's um, it's 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 um, it'll be interesting to actually talk to some some people that live there at some stage, and maybe we can find some some tech startups in Belarus and and get some perspective from some of the women working there because that'd be really mm. yeah. Have you got any trips planned for Belarus, Chris? No, it's a funny place. Oh. It's kind of one of the more pro-Russia ex-Russian states, um, which gives it an interesting dynamic. Uh, I think it also claims from memory, uh, officially it claims to have Europe's last dictator. Um, Well. (laughs) Although, uh, anyway, Hungary is rapidly maybe becoming like that too, but that's a whole other Mm, conversation. Indeed. Um, Indeed. Yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, something related, but not really. <laughs> uh, this was a post I came across on the Teambit blog, uh, how teams can be more productive by killing eight-hour workday. Ah. Uh, the grammar there is a little weird. But anyway, um, it is something I think I've always agreed with. Uh, there's this uh, 888. Mm. Uh, there's actually an 888 monument in Melbourne. Um, 
I was always told that Australia claimed to have, who have invented the eight-hour workday, but I'm not 100% sure if that's true. I don't know who told me that. I think that uh, was a union thing. That the It wasn't that they... They invented it. It's that they enforced the right to yeah. only have to work eight hours. But Australia was first or something like that. Mm. I'm not sure. Something like that. The basic mm. principle was always eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for leisure. Um, and this sort of replaced um, the heavy industrialised work uh, a few mm. centuries ago when it made sense to be running machines longer with people running them longer because you could make more mm. um, and the sort of effect is this of a human operating a machine doesn't decrease so much uh, after 10, 12, 14 hours. So keep it going. You know, it's mm. worth it to keep it going. And then as the nature of work changed, we were able to 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 change uh, mm. the the style of the day to, to have more time for leisure and things like mm. that. Um, but this, this article puts the question, which I've heard before, and I've, uh, this is not a new idea, that uh, eight hours is maybe too much now, mm. um, especially in high in work that involves high brain usage. Yeah. Um, your brain can burn out pretty quickly, maybe five, six hours tops, and you're just spending a lot of your time doing nothing, really. Yeah. Um, and you can accomplish just as much in less time. Um, well, what is interesting here is how this, I mean, there's, there's, the, the, the optimist would say you could work a six hour day and earn the same because you achieve the same. Yeah. The pessimist or the realist would say you'll get paid less mm. because work, because bosses will say, well, you're working less, even though you're accomplishing the same. So the natural conclusions of this kind of change are an interesting one. As a freelancer, I actually... I, I I keep tabs on all the time I put in mm. on a day, and I actually average billing time about six hours a day. Mm. So I don't actually work eight hours a day. Um, but then what defines work for me is somewhat varied. Um, is recording this podcast work, etc. Do mm. I include that, that sort of thing? Mm. Um, but I'm actually a big believer in this. I, I think I'm a, half the reason I work for myself is because I like, I have, I know my, uh, times when I work best, and they don't always match uh, a nine to five or yeah, ten to likewise. six office environment. Um, any thoughts, Kate? Yeah, I do actually. I mean, I think firstly, this notion that um, an eight hours being optimum for most people is highly inaccurate. Um, I also would question that most people work eight hours a day in terms of actual well, output. Exactly. And the reason yeah. I say that is, um, you know, we both work remotely. So we work at home, we work in a co-working space, what have you. Um, I know when I've worked in offices, how long do you spend chit-chatting? Um, if you smoke, going out for smoke breaks. Uh, move, go, I used to have colleagues that would go out every half an hour and move their car. Oh. Um, uh, you know, just doing pointless meetings, having a having morning tea, birthdays, all this stuff that you don't do if you work at home. I mean, you do other things, like you might put the washing on or, you know, Actually, Kate, have a coffee. You said, something, you said something very interesting there that I just want to pick up on because we both discussed earlier this week, uh, you already said we we largely work remotely. Correct. Um, we split our time between working from home and working at co-working spaces, mm. but the people that we work with, we are very rarely in the same places. And we That's both right. commented on how much we feel like we're missing sometimes. Um, and this is an interesting aspect that sometimes gets overlooked in these conversations when you just said chit-chatting, making mm. coffee, etc. Whilst they're not directly work, they're actually important aspects of the work dynamic. Very important. You know, the getting to know each other better, getting to understand each other better on a personal level and things like that. And I sometimes do feel, even though as much as I like remote work, that is something that you do lack. Mm. And those those teams that even get together once every few months to have a drink, you know, in one yeah. country or something like that. I think that actually helps a lot. It's actually an interesting thing. Like not all wasted time is wasted. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. implying it's those those tasks are bad. I don't mean that. No. I mean, maybe they're moving the car one, but I don't mean they're bad. It's more that, um, you know, if, if this idea that a, an eight hour workday means eight hours of solid work, mm, it's, yeah, I'm yeah. more saying it's not, it's not entirely accurate. Um, I mean, I think you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of brainstorming. Uh, it's how I think. 
um, mm. sometimes out loud <laughs> while I'm while I'm writing sometimes while I'm you know mm. and I, I do miss that the most probably having people to brainstorm with um, mm. Mm. because it's it's hard to, it's very hard to do online or on a call because firstly you, you tend to talk over each other um, it's very hard to pace who's talking next sort of stuff it's you don't get that free flow that you get when people are in front of you because you can't talk at the same uh rhythm perhaps that's the mm-hmm. word i'm thinking of um yeah some of those things and and i mean i work for a team that's entirely remote so everyone is in different cities mm. so it's um you know and i know I, as you know and the listeners probably know i've always been a big fan of buffer and the way they've managed remote teams mm. because they have a lot of systems in place yeah yeah. Um, yeah. But they also do things like retreats for different yeah. divisions and a big one for everybody once a year. There are ways to solve this problem. There are. And a lot of it's invested. Yeah. In, it's whether a company is willing to invest yeah. the time and the money and the resources to do it. And uh, I would think this is going to become a bigger issue because, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing stats like 40% of Americans are now working remotely. Um, mm. I don't know how many of that is the gig, the gig economy, sorry, um, or working freelance or what have you. But this is going to become the new norm. We're going to get that shorter working week, that shorter working um, day. And, yeah, that was the other thing I was going to add before to our discussion. There are already, us, for example, startups that only do f- four, four days a week in summer and things like that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different um, different thoughts about this kind of stuff. And I think it's, um, you know, if we're, we're going to reap the benefits of automation and machines and all this sort of stuff. Exactly. That's this is nice, where it all comes nice together. Tying of the, nice tying of the end of the conversation there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, let's wrap up this kind of I don't know what we call this the changing of the way we are section. Yeah. With an article I found quite fascinating as a writer as a ling as a, well, I'm, not, I'm not a linguist but I uh, I'm a fan a, of a language. words enthusiast. With an article on Mashable, millennials have created a form of written English that's as expressive as spoken English, and this is quite a fascinating article about. Um, how millennials, and I, that's such a vague term, apparently I'm a millennial, but uh, I didn't used to be, and I would probably never use half the things in this post. So I, I think I'm on the, the, uh, the, the uh, older end of the millennial bracket, uh, definitely. Um, it's like an acronyms, um, shorthand, emojis, mm. repurposing punctuation and things to... To put more expressiveness into language, I, I find it's quite fascinating. I think the thing that concerns me about this, uh, and I've sort of already alluded it to myself as having a problem, is if you're not aware of it, mm. you have the potential to misunderstand or be misunderstood. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, I tend to use um, the ellipses, three dots ellipses a lot, to mean kind of something continuing, something ongoing. And that's something very personal. But then I found that apparently um, in millennial speak, a three-dot ellipsis denotes denotes an awkward or annoyed silence. (laughs) So I have this potential to be completely misunderstood or um, misunderstand someone else because I wasn't aware of this new uh, trend in writing. So I think this is one of the interesting things. And I find this a lot with um, memes and... Uh, new slang is if you're not part of the crowd it can Mm. be very confusing Mm. and knowing what it is like I actually have a lot of friends who are much more onto pop culture than me and they'll say something and I have absolutely no idea what they mean (laughs) and they're surprised you don't know what they mean yeah and I don't know how people even pick this stuff up in the first place like certain tv shows certain video games I don't know what it is but um yeah, it's a fascinating post. Isn't I'm not it? entirely sure what I think about it. But it's just... Yeah, I'm just the f- I, I just like the idea that traditional, well, I don't know if that's even the right word, but that language ev- um, changes and evolves over time based on who's using it. Very mm. interesting. And that people do have, you know, people in the, in the same, I don't know, if, if I can say the same culture, that's not even right. But people, people can all have a different understanding, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because mm. that's very interesting too. Mm. All right then, Kate, we're going to, by way of an article of your choosing, we're going to transition into some of um, more discussion of what we've been up to and then a particular uh, event, maybe. Yeah. Um, But maybe you would like to round off the other people's articles with the last one on something that is happening in, or something that happened in New York. Uh, Yeah, um, in Plattsburgh, New York, the council 
approved the city council approved an 18 month moratorium on new cryptocurrency mining operations and this bit I quite like. The temporary ban will be used to figure out what to do with these ding-dong miners using up all the electricity. <laughs> um, so what they're, what they're talking about is basically that, you know, the amount of energy that's being used, because most cryptocurrencies require a mining process in which servers are used to guess the solution to a complex equation, um, and basically the, the computer that gets the answer gets, gets coin or what have you. To do all this is this massive process of, of mining mining rigs, I guess. And I, I'm sure people have seen some of those videos that first came out um, when we sort of started hearing about um, crypto, where, um, I don't know, I saw one in China, and it was like these data mining farms where it was literally like rooms and rooms of, um, of hardware, um, floor-to-ceiling hardware, um, massive warehouses, and, and a guy that would just sleep there, and he'd walk around and make sure all the machines were working. And so what's been happening is miners are going to cities with cheap power and mm. um, and mining. <laughs> you know, and I've, I've even heard of stories where people are doing it in Airbnbs and things like that. And basically what, what's been happening is that the city gets 104 megawatt of hours of electricity a month. And if it exceeds its... Um, it's, it's amount. It has to pay a, a premium on the open market. So this is the problem. And in January, they use too much. Um, and, for some, it, and it was literally everyone's bills rose. Some, some doubled because... And, it, and you know, they, they've... Um, if you compare this to, like, you know, saying, oh, that's just energy in winter. In winter, people would get an increase of, of $10. Now they're mm. getting $100. Some people, $200. Um, and so they just say, look, this is, you know, we're going to have to... Uh, imp- impose some tariffs and it also raises some of these en- these issues we keep hearing about the economic value of of, me- of Bitcoin I mean who's benefiting here it's not the residents they're the ones that are losing um, but then you've got other people in the town that are kind of saying well you know we, we could get some money out of this whole crypto thing and is there a benefit to us so this stuff is it's, it's a complex issue and I actually um interviewed a company a few weeks back i haven't had time to um to do anything with it yet they're building a a mining center if you like in um iceland because the power there Mm. is so cheap and you know they've got the only thing that is but yeah (laughs) yeah, they've got the um they've got the building they've got it set up they've done the research you know it's all kind of systems go and they're i think the south african company so um yeah yeah, this 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 is not a problem that's going to go away you know no well uh, uh yeah anyway I think this is a nice transition to our, our next topic, um, just in that uh, blockchain-based technologies all operate in different ways. Mm. Um, I think this is specifically Bitcoin mining, which has become very resource-intensive. I actually, I actually sold all my Bitcoin mm. a couple of months ago because of the environmental impact of them. I couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't really, I didn't couldn't really feel like, it. yeah, mm. it felt, it felt like. Um, Something I couldn't get behind anymore. So let's move on to what we've been up to the past few weeks. And we'll start off uh, with a segue from this into the, what was it called? The crypto, what was the conference called now? <laughs> uh, um, the, I, think it, I think it was just crypto conference. It was <laughs> crypto called conference. the International Crypto, no, the C3 Crypto Conference. Um, this... Uh, hmm. I've written one kind of follow-up to this, uh, which just got published on DZone today, actually, on uh, the tokenization of everything, <laughs> um, which I would urge you to read. Um, I think uh, maybe we'll talk about it in more detail next show, possibly, but this kind of aspect that so many companies now are trying to put tokens into everything. Yeah. And some of them make sense, some of them don't make sense. Uh, but this article, I kind of dive into a bit of if that was the case, if we tokenized everything, mm. what would that mean mm. for society and money? Uh, and it was off the back of a comment from someone I spoke to at this conference who said we could create a kind of universal basic income by tokenizing everything. And I kind of <laughs> thought about it and thought about this kind of potential future and, and what it could mean. Um mm. But the conference itself, I mean, I think we are going to work on a shared we write-up are. of it at some point soon, but it was a weird event, wasn't it, It was Kate? a very odd event. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything or... Um, uh, look, I'll, I'll just very briefly say make a few points. I mean, 
I don't know. You, firstly, you had this demarcation of between the paid and the unpaid, which I never feel very comfortable with. I think, you know, what do you mean? Conferences should be accessible, so that they had a section that people could go for, to go to for free, and one that for, no, was only... that wasn't quite right. I mean, they paid different amounts. Uh, I thought it was yeah. free. Okay, yeah. So they had one section with free food, and one section you had to buy it, and it was the same food. <laughs> they, things yeah, like that, I just don't like. I think it's um, it's you not know, uncommon, but usually the building is bigger, and you don't notice it yeah. so much. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 and I know that we have the privilege of, you know, being journos, we get to go for free ourselves. Yeah. But, you know, I like, I'd like. i like to think other people could get that same same right where, where, you know, if they had some tickets for, you know, low income or what have you, things like that. I think it's important. But, um, okay, so t- firstly, the, the, the pros of the conference, there were some really good speakers, um, and we'll go into those in the article in more detail. We'll walk through some of those and what they were talking about and, and so on. Um, there was quite a few women at the conference, which I think mm-hmm. is great um, because people say, "Where are all the women?" Well, they're they're, all, they're actually there. <laughs> Trust me. Um, there was a there was a few stalls I thought doing some interesting work, um, mm-hmm. particularly in the health field, um, yep. where they were looking at developing countries and things like that. All things I'm a big fan of. I like the product behind the coin. I'm not so interested mm-hmm. in the coins and the ICOs. I'm more into mm-hmm. the blockchain side of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think this this was one thing that we both discussed. Previously, there's been a real kind of separation between that mm-hmm. that we're starting to see between the ICO hype and the blockchain itself or the blockchain technologies, because there's a few. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, and look, the, the downsides was that for a industry, if I could call it that, that's trying to be disruptive, is trying to massively change the way we manage every, pretty much every aspect of our society from the law to um, – to jobs, to how we transact money, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, they're, they're, some of their gender gender um, gender values are pretty fucked, honestly. I, I think it depends on the country of origin. Uh, okay, let me, let me yeah. explain that and why I say that. Firstly, um, I, I always get very annoyed at a conference that has a um, – a panel of women talking about being women. <laughs> I would like women talking about what they're interested in much yep. more. But and I would say that for it, I think any equity group, if I could use that term, would have the same problem. You know, people of color don't want to just talk about that, for example, yeah. or yeah. you know, blah blah blah. So you had, to, but what happened was, you know, when I mentioned the two rooms, like the paid room and the unpaid room, or the lesser paid, whatever you call it, um, that was actually the, the the cheaper room was the one with the stalls. So people had paid these massive amounts for these stalls so they could present their wares and presumably get some customers or some funding or what have you, collaborations. Um, And there was a little stage for pitching. So, But unfortunately, there'd been some problematic stall placement. So while people were pitching, right next door was a VR porn stall. And um, so you which is could, also tokenized, of course. Which yes, it was. So you had um, a video sh- playing on a screen, which was right next to the speakers' heads. Unfortunately, showing uh, VR porn, and yes, you could see bits of bodies. In case you're wondering, you could see you boobs doing porn. Yes, yes, boobs <laughs> and bums and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, there was also a little um, booth where men could go and try out the VR porn. So you had a line of men waiting to go and play VR porn while people were talking. Um, and and just the juxtaposition of when you've got, for example, a woman up talking about something to do with um, health or, you know, a, a product for young people and the woman had brought her daughters along, then you've got all these men going to do VR porn. Like, seriously? I mean, it was embarrassing, I've got to say. And, look, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I get there's VR porn. I don't have a problem with it existing, but I think time and place and context is very important. How, and I think that... Um, as an industry who's trying to really disrupt pretty much everything, to, it, it just seemed incredibly disrespectful to not only the women, but all the speakers, really. Mm. I think it was tacky. And, and then you had this uh, problem, which uh, people who know the show and know me know that I've spoken about and written about it quite a bit, the booth babes. <laughs> so if you don't know what a booth babe is, it's basically women that are employed um, from an agency or, or something like that to wear something uh, sexy, I guess, lots of makeup, high heels, and talk to men at the conference. So they don't work. That they're, they're not like you know the marketing team of the agency or what have of the the business. But they just, um, yeah, they're there to get men to come over to the booth and talk to them. And 
like seriously, aren't we better than this? Um, you know, I, I find this notion, firstly, that it men men are, are so easily uh, swayed by this kind of atavistic urges, quite ridiculous and and not very accurate either. Most men were embarrassed by it. And secondly, you know, what does it say for the women at the conference who are, um, you know, trying to present and be credible and learning mm-hmm. and and engaging? And I spoke to quite a few women about it because um, people mentioned it to me, so like. I had someone told me they'd gone up to the booth and said, um, oh, is this a, a crypto for escorts? Because <laughs> they, they actually didn't know what it was. It was actually mm. something to do with social media. It was yeah. based it was based in Berlin. Um, and Which the, I was, um, I was the people behind by. it were Hungarian, yeah. I believe. I think they were a mix ah, of right. different mm-hmm. ethnicities and backgrounds. Mm. But, you know, I, I think, um, and this is, you know, this is not the first time we've heard these stories. No. I mean, a colleague of mine from Mementa went to a, a crypto conference in Miami where the after party was held at a strip club. Like, you know, this, and, he, and, and people didn't want to go. They were just like, you know, I, I meant to go because my clients are there, but I mm. don't want to go because, you know, it's not my thing. So, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I don't know. It was a weird event. I found it strange. I think I'm actually less positive <laughs> overall than you, yeah. bizarrely, despite that comment you just said. Um, I found it very odd. It was uh, odd. In the, my grand efforts to convince people that blockchain-based projects are worthy and interesting, events like this don't help. No, uh, exactly. It was just weird, tacky, tacky, odd, odd projects that just were jumping on a bandwagon. Yeah, it wasn't one of the better crypto events I've been to. Definitely not. Maybe I'll just leave it there. Yeah. But it sparked, I'm finding it very hard to know what to say because I want to be helpful and constructive and not just whinge. <laughs> but that, that's my natural reaction. Um, yeah, and I think the best output I, I've had of it is this article I wrote on the tokenizing of mm. everything. Mm. And I look forward to reading it. A lot of it's from seeing a lot of weird ideas for tokenizing everything but you know it takes multiple facets to sort of to to make a community and make an economy i guess so it's something for everybody but all right let's um let's move on kate uh what else have you been writing about over the past couple of weeks any any particular articles you want to highlight I mean, I'll keep it relatively brief, but um, I've been writing a bit about smart cities, looking at um, what makes a successful smart city. Um, two notable examples that have been, you know, flung around a lot over the last few months, particularly are Bristol in the UK mm. and Amsterdam, which has mm. um, been been doing it a lot longer, of course. Um, and it's funny because I spoke to Bristol a couple of years about smart cities and, and were asking where they were up to, and they were they were um, pretty early on, so they've evolved quite quite quickly in um, a couple of years, and they've actually um, won a, a GSMA award for their efforts. Um, mm-hmm. They're particularly good with um, the Bristol is Open project, where which is about open city data, which I'm of uh, data, sorry, which I'm a big fan of. Um, but I also looked at you know some of the some of the cases where cities struggle, and it's things like siloed projects, projects that only rely on funding and can't um, have no return on no no real return on investment. Uh, looking at things like um, you know how, how do you decide who who to engage with, so that the ideas are actually by the local people rather than for the local people so people mm. get to prioritize things all these things and you know the, the whole idea of a smart city is one that makes people's lives better and easier but also it should be fairly seamless um so that it's you know in, in an ideal world we wouldn't notice this stuff as much it just it just integrates really nicely mm, mm, um mm. just one other topic i'll mention so i'm not talking too much and I'll we'll have all the links in the show notes, is mm-hmm. data monetization because it's something I've been having a lot of interest in for a while. Um, and I actually interviewed a company this week about it um, for consumers or, for, you know, people who use social media or what have you. Or, um, but in this, these, I wrote a couple of articles on data monetization looking specifically at um, the use of it in... Um, in machines and in um, things like cars. Uh, uh, and, and some of the companies involved are really interesting. I mean, it's not all blockchain. Like a lot of people go, oh, blockchain, blockchain. But people like, for example, Samsung Arctic released a smart IoT platform mm. last year, which includes a, a monetization part where basically 
uh, people can share their IoT data amongst applications with researchers, um, creating new business models like hardware as a service where, you know, and basically being able to have different tiers of monetization amongst factories and, 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 and clients and customers and vendors, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you've got the idea of like, for example, the IOTA Foundation has been working with a, a whole slew of people, including Deutsche Telekom, Bosch, PwC, um, blah, blah, blah. And, and creating one of those, I guess, a marketplace or a platform, if you like, where people can buy and sell data and from sensors, connected devices, this kind of stuff. Mm. And I guess if you're kind of thinking, well, why would you do all this, blah, you know, firstly, um, the idea of using the blockchain for this is, is around the idea of data authenticity. The reality is that um, data is the, is, is the new oil. It is a big monetization kind of spinning thing. Um, it's happening already in a lot of industries. And so the issues of um, the authenticity of the data, so we know the data is from the machine and it's accurate. Secondly, the um, GDPR coming in, of course, People want to know that um, the rights of, of data, whether it's sold and third parties and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then I took a, a, a more detailed look at kind of, well, what's happening from that? Like we've got this thing kind of burgeoning along. For example, in Israel, there's, um, I'm trying to say the name right because I do get it wrong. Autonomo. <laughs> it's a connected car database where basically car data can be um, bought and sold. Um, you think about it, how many sensors are on a car these days. In the future, it's going to be you know up to 200 to 500 every part of the car. So that's all stuff that can be used in some capacity. And another really interesting example is um, a company in the US called Farmobile. And basically what they do, well, Farm, Farm Mobile, sorry, um, Farmers pay a yearly subscription and they have a little device that sits in the machines, um, a small in-cab device, and records all the data from the farm. It could be things like um, uh, the variety of grains, the, um, the growing cycles, the yield, all that kind of stuff. And twice a year, the data is certified and put in a data store where it can be sold. Um, by people like equip- – like you might go, well, who wants that? Equipment manufacturers – agronomists, insurers, people like that. And then they get paid twice a year. So it's a pretty a pretty sweet system. It's the first one in, um, in that industry. But then you've got this kind of thing which is coming even more big, which is the idea of machines selling data and creating products within each other, which becomes a little bit more complicated. And some of this is looking at things like um, the idea that um, devices – that have any um, excess uh, storage capacity, for example, um, that can be used and, um, and monetized. Um, then you've got things like um, Singularity Net. People would know from um, Hanson Robotics, who makes Sophie. They're partnering with um, Ocean Protocol, where they're looking at a, or they, they have created, I guess, a, a decentralized global market for AI services where paid parties, sorry, own their data and can sell it and things like that. So this this stuff is becoming kind of big business. Um, we know that we're going to pro- potentially see things like intel- intelligence as, as a service where machines can learn from each other, work together in groups to create more money <laughs> and trade amongst themselves. Like this stuff gets re- really kind of a little bit woo-woo, but it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Oh, okay. I, I I think you had far more to say on that subject than you or I both expected. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. That, that's uh, actually I saw um, Ocean Protocol. So Trent, who has actually been on our uh, to to interview list for quite a oh, while. Oh yeah, we should we should chase him up. Uh, speak a couple of weeks ago. Um, he 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 tends to talk in very grandiose ways that sometimes you have to sort of drill down into what that means but the ocean protocol is an interesting idea and yeah it feeds into this whole world of users monetizing their data or probably more realistically to begin with as you said um businesses monetizing their data with other businesses Uh, and this has become increasingly relevant with various events in the news of the past few weeks yeah um how this exactly would work is a whole big discussion. I think it's quite a fascinating discussion. It is. But, um, yeah, and I interviewed some people at Mobile World Congress who also talked about this. 
Uh, and I think, yeah, the, the business-to-business valuization of data is the first logical step. And in mm. consumers, we shall see. Um, it may be that external factors convince consumers to do that more. Yeah, uh, well, I think... We shall see, th- we shall see. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I think the, one, yeah. the, the news of the week, but also GDPR, will change a lot yeah. of things. Yeah, it's interesting times. Um, from me, uh, a little less uh, grandiose. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> I had a, an article on CodeShip on what is design ops, uh, how designers can leverage some of the similar practices of developers in kind of collaborating on their work. Um, I alluded to it earlier. We had a previous podcast and interview with EmoShape, the first emotional processing unit, which was Ooh. kind of interesting. In follow-up to my article on making the Atom text editor uh, good for writing, I did one on Visual Studio Code, uh, which people have been asking for for quite a while, and I finally did that. And then the Tokenize All the Things article, which just got published today. Uh, I have another article waiting to be published very soon. Actually, I've got a lot of articles waiting to be published, but one that should probably also be published by the time this is out uh, is on uh, I kind of wrote this in about half an hour because I got very wow. passionate about it after Apple announced that they uh, possibly considering using their own processes about um, will <laughs> will 2021 finally be the year of the Linux desktop when no one else cares anymore um, mm. which we'll, we'll see that's that a lofty statement well I don't know I, I think maybe that's half the point that maybe it isn't anymore so mm. <laughs> is, let's talk about events mm-hmm. so probably just in time for this episode if you are in Berlin I cannot make it but I'm hoping Kate will be there for the Good Technology Collective's Ethics and Engineering event yes uh, I'm unfortunately travelling but Kate should hopefully be there if anyone is in Berlin and going to that which is of course something we uh, have been talking about a lot. Absolutely. And then I actually have a lot of travel coming up over the next few weeks. So you can pretty much find me on any continent over the next month. Very true. Um, I will be at Collision in New Orleans. I will be at Right the Docks North America in Portland. I will be at the Catapult Future Fest in Oslo. I will be at the Mauritian Developers Conference in wow. Mauritius. I will be at SoapConf in Krakow and I will be at the Evolution of Technical Communication in Sofia. And then also if you're into games, I will be at the UK Games Expo. That's more for fun. <laughs> and finally, still in negotiation, but it looks like Kate and I will also be at Login slash uh, Lithuania in the beginning of June. So <laughs> quite a lot of places. Some I get busy for events. You can come and meet. Oh, Kate will also be coming to Krakow, but not coming to SoapConf. So if you want to meet Kate, but you're not actually going to the conference uh, in Krakow. You if you just can. want to hang out and go for a beverage. Yeah, exactly. Give me a Krakow boy. is a beautiful city and in May it should be very nice. So, yeah. I think you'll be putting all those in the um, the little calendar we've got. They're, they're already in the calendar, apart from the Mauritian one okay. and the Lithuanian one, because they're still in yeah. there. So you can take yeah, a look there, what we're, yeah. what we're out and about yeah. and up to. So if you've enjoyed the show, you can find previous episodes at com slash podcast. We've just moved our hosting to Anchor FM, uh, which means you will also find our show in a few other places you couldn't find it before. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed it, please rate us, please share. It's a lot of work in each of these episodes and we appreciate uh, anything you can help to spread the word. If you want to support in uh, other ways, you can give us a donation or buy some merchandise at gregariousmammal.com slash support. We are actually coming up to our 100th show uh, soon, in a couple of months, and we're planning something a little different for it. Um, We might get a few of our favourite interviewees back on the show yeah absolutely we might uh we might plan to launch a few things around that time overhaul the website get a patreon going things like that um if you want to continue the conversation you can find us on a gregarious mammal no you can <laughs> you can find us 
as Gregarious Marable on Facebook. Uh, and you can also now find us on LinkedIn if either of those is your kind of network. Hmm. Kate, if the people want to get in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, you can find me on katelawrence.com. That's Kate with C, Lawrence with a W, or on the good old Twitter, which is at Kate underscore Lawrence. Again, that's a C, not a K, and a W, not a U. <laughs> and we actually discovered a tech, uh, sort of tech journalist recently in Berlin who we have to try and find, I know. who is actually called Catherine Lawrence with a K and a U. <laughs> I oh, know, it's like my um, doppelganger with a slightly, my sister we'll with a slightly different matching name. matching t-shirts. Yeah, how funny would that be? <laughs> and you can find me on christianchiller.com or at Chris Chinch on Twitter. And yeah, we will talk to you all again soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. 